Ashley Balding, and I am Chief Sales Officer for Alhi. have the privilege of working for this incredible organization for close to 17 years, and we are so grateful to be together today. Look at this room. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> awesome. Just so everyone is in the know, of course, we have this impressive group live, impressive group of leaders. Thank you for being here. And then we have quite a few folks joining us virtually. So hello, good morning, thank you. That includes our talented GSO team. Love and appreciate you guys so much. It's terrific to be welcoming you. And frankly, it's, it's a bit emotional. These have definitely been uncertain and enormously difficult times for you, for our hotels and resorts, for Alhi, for Delta Airlines in the room, and for the hospitality industry. But we're excited to reconvene together to work toward advancing our organizations. And you're here to listen because you're eager to learn and you're determined to focus forward. Leaders like you are the ones that find pathways and we have faith to be able to navigate through the difficult times. As leaders, we also need to confront the brutal facts of the situation, and we need to handle it, and we need to advance forward, and that's what this Back to Business Forum is all about. So you being here and listening today really shows us that we're facing these brutal facts so we can learn, overcome, and move forward because we will prevail we will get through this. For just a minute, yes, I know we will. There's been so much going on over the last few months, and I just want to take a second to, to shift. And for me, um, I assume like many of you, you've had a lot of time to reflect, and this time has formed a better me. Uh, I'm not, both, both, both personally and professionally, and I'm not taking away any of the tragedies or hardships that have gone on with this pandemic. It is sad and will forever be remembered. But I am grateful for the opportunity to reflect and change. We have all learned and changed at some capacity. I've learned to laugh a bit more at the absurdity of the situation. The concept of change and having to do things a bit differently has taught me essentially to change and get on with it. Now I accept change with joy and acceptance. Our Alhi culture is stronger than ever because of change. Communication and transparency is priority number one. I've learned that you can have hard conversations and get awkward with people you may or may not know, personally or professionally, because we're all just determined to get through this together. I've also learned to stock up on toilet paper. Never in my life did I think I would ever have to borrow six rolls of toilet paper from my CEO because I couldn't find it in Dallas. And that is a true story. I learned to be kinder, kinder to myself, and just to take care of me, and then kinder to others, and all cultures and differences that this beautiful world has to offer. I learned the value of teachers. I love my children. I have two girls, Ella, who's eight, and Jetty, who's five. Hello, girls, they're listening. Of course, they know Zoom, or, or they, know, they know how to tap into a, a program to listen to something. But my gift is teaching them confidence and ethics and having valuable conversations, but I am not a school teacher. I learned to re that we're so blessed to have witnessed the heart and strength of our leader every single day. Mike is awesome, ladies and gentlemen. His authentic passion, his unwavering commitment to research, and the heart and soul that he has for this industry is truly remarkable. The ongoing gift that we can give each other is just support. And this is something that I've learned. It's made me more vulnerable. It's made me more grateful, less judgmental, and just more appreciative of the world and everything it has to offer. So this Back to Business Forum is needed. It's time to bring meetings back. Mike walked in, said, let's do this, Katie. And I said, OK. He called Q. Q said, sure, let's do it. And here we are. And so a lot of you met Carolyn Dent last night, managing director of this fabulous hotel, an incredible leader, and a dear friend. Thank you. Q, thank you for saying yes and agreeing to do this. And for the entire Omni Dallas team, you really are a lab. 
and you're stepping up to the plate to show others how it's done and how it's done in a responsible way. Alhi loves and we respect Omni organizations so much and we marvel at how they proactively have adjusted and established new protocols. You'll hear from Dan Surratt later, Chief Sales Officer, Kara Banash in a breakout, Mark Wikes, and I hope you meet all of the Omni folks here. We also have a few select members in the room. Thank you, David Menzella with Pensadas, Linda Maurer with La Cantera, and many others. Finally, and although we've changed and we're doing it differently, nothing will replace face-to-face. -face. And although Zoom has a new meaning and it's plugged a gap, the benefits of human interaction, authentic conversations, and the ability to get to know each other when you're in a face-to-face environment expands us and makes us better people. My table last night with Pam, Tina, and Stephanie, we could have never had the authentic conversation had we not been face-to-face. -face. So Alhi remains optimistic. Our hotels are tooling to overcome this, and you're gonna experience this at the Omni Dallas, just like you are right now. Together, we will activate responsible strategies. Not taking anything away from our virtual audience, and I do mean that, but thank you for the courageous leaders in the room, for trusting Alhi and trusting Omni to deliver a safe and educational laboratory to learn from. By being here, you have already overcome objections and some fear. Out of my table of four, two had not flown since February. So you truly are a valuable extension and a lab to the lab that we've created here. So let's get on with it and focus forward. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome our president and CEO of Associated Luxury Hotels, somebody whom I'm proud to be affiliated with, Mr. Mike Demey. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I, I am privileged to be able to work side by side with Ashley. And you see the passion and, and how authentic she is. So we are excited and uh, everything's a laboratory. I told her that was perfect, except you were supposed to exit that side of the stage. That's why I didn't have my mask on and I kept away. But that's what today is about, is thinking about the things that we don't always think about. It's one entrance, one exit, and that's also for our, 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 our audiovisual tech so that they know what they're having to clean and not clean. So something that simple, we through the day, we said this is a laboratory. We're gonna be teaching, and again, we're gonna put our dirty laundry out there. By the way, the toilet paper story is not made up. She was freaking out, and thank God for my, my, my wife actually stocks up toilet paper like crazy for some reason, and we actually had it. And I, I did borrow it, and funniest thing of that story, she actually returned it. She, she bought me more later, and I'm like, you really didn't have to, it's quite all right. Um, for our virtual audience, you know, she said we have a few people uh, joining us virtually. We had 800 people sign up for the virtual component. And I must say, it's the challenge we're all dealing with. There's many people virtually today that wanted to be here but couldn't for a variety of reasons. Whether it's their state with certain restrictions on what they can and can't do and they can't afford a 14-day quarantine, whether it is their own travel policies not allowing them to travel yet, we're all gonna be dealing with this over the next, literally, the next 90, 120 days. Um, what we're doing over the next day and a half, or day and a half, it feels like that, that would have been last night. What we're doing today is really about 21. For those of you that are starting to think about how do you move forward in 21, those decisions are coming in the next 60 to 90 days, and we know that. This is not about 20. Uh, I always say anything for 20 now is gravy. If we get, if the, something comes in for 20, we're all gonna learn and we're gonna continue to grow. But what we've done at Alhi, if you, if you've looked at, we, we had an executive women in leadership conference in Naples just a few weeks ago. It's been three weeks now. And that was 50 people. And now we're over 100 people. And we will be ramping up to our executive exchange that's in November that will be over 250. Uh, but each one of these, we're learning how to do it bigger. Uh, and I don't mean bigger in the old sense, bigger as far as the size and capacity and what that looks like. So for the laboratory for today, a um, couple of things that were going on. If you notice today, flow of the room matters. So you all entered from the back of the room. You will be exiting through the sides of the room. And when you exit, by the way, if you notice on your tables, there's a color on your, on your actual name card. We're gonna release you by colors. So realize you stay seated until we call your color to leave the room. These are things you never had to think about before. But if you're really gonna try to make sure you minimize traffic and flow, these are the things you have to think about today. And, and just high level, we'll be exiting the sides of the room first, and then the middle will go last, um, as far as colors. And that makes sense since we're exiting through the sides. Um, more to come as we go through that. Uh, we're also, if you've, you, as you've gotten seated, 
you should have written your name on your, uh, your nameplate. Uh, the reason for that is this is your place for the day. And you don't bounce around, you come back to the same place and that way we can ensure that nobody else has been in, your, in, your, in the place that you're gonna be sitting for the, the next six, six eight hours. Uh, at the end of the sessions, I already talked about that. We're gonna do a group photo, uh, but the group photo is gonna be from stage with you here so that we can still practice social distancing. Uh, we did this before uh, at Ewell and it was, it was quite a task, but uh, bear with us, we're gonna show you how to do that because you may want a group photo when you're doing these type of events and how do you do that and how do you pull it off? We're gonna be able to show that as well. Um, the breakouts have been set for you, and if you look at them, you'll see them on the slides. Uh, they, they, they've, been, they've been flowing through, but we, we have them set in protocol in different sets that you might utilize. Uh, there's a break this afternoon or this morning, and that break is for you to go see the rooms. Because once you get to your breakouts, you're going to be seated, and we're going to move the presenters. We're not moving the people. And that is how you now move four people versus 120 people uh, during a breakout session. Again, things that you should rethink uh, on what the flow is going to look like. And, and that's, that's why we kept saying today's a laboratory. We're really going to talk about where we're headed and how you can see a path forward if you want to. Uh, I think most encouraging, and it's the way I like to roll, is we will have Slido, uh, but it is crowdsourced. So you're going to be able to start posting questions as we're talking, and you're going to be able to like questions. And the most liked questions are going to raise to the top, and everybody's going to see it. It's going to be very open, and we're going to have the conversation we want to have. And by the way, those Slido questions are both for uh, in-person and virtual. They're both going to flow right into it, so we're going to get the full audience as far as what, wants, what we want to talk about while we're here. Um, for those of you who, who have been participating in the past uh, 90 to 120 days of our weekly client calls and the updates, uh, that was pu purely organic. It, it, is, it wasn't planned. It wasn't intentional. It started by literally um, me being encouraged by a friend to post on LinkedIn and to talk about, wait, some of the data is just not having context to it. And that grew into one call a week with you know, our members, and that grew into one call a week with our, with our clients. And then it became two calls with our clients because we had that many clients and we wanted to get timing. It was organic, uh, but we felt it, felt it was a need. And uh, for those of you that have known me uh, for some time, I love this industry. I'm passionate about this industry and I'm committed to do everything we can to get the industry moving forward for those that are ready to move. There are some that won't be for a variety of reasons. We need to be able to show a path forward for those that are able to and wanting to. And, th and that really is what today's about. Um, my, since I'm not doing my weekly updates uh, this week, I, I did promise, you know, if you want to know where everything is, we're on the downside of this, of this wave. And everything is declining if you look at all the, all the data from Texas. Texas is declining in cases. They're declining in hospitalizations. Deaths have stabilized. You'll see the decline, especially with hospitalizations going down. Florida, the plummeting with cases, plummeting with hospitalizations. Deaths are starting to plateau. Same in California. You're starting to see that. California is a little messy right now from a number standpoint just because they had a backlog of a lot of tests that just got dumped in. So you messes up the trend line just a little bit and we have to let that settle down. But all trend lines are pointing the right direction. Um, I'm adamant and I've said this often, this was not a second wave. This was the wave for the South and the West. And guess where the wave is now? In the middle of the country. You're starting to see it in Montana and Wyoming because they never went through it. And for someone who's been studying the data for a long period of time, everybody's gonna go through their wave at some point. It's how you manage it is gonna be the important part. And I've stressed this over and over. This entire, this entire uh, subset over the 90 days about staying at home and, and literally sheltering in place and wearing masks and doing everything we're doing, it was never, you've never heard anybody say, let's get rid of the curve. It was flatten the curve, which means there will be cases. We need to make sure that the hospitals can handle it. That's what this is all about. And I think that doesn't get represented appropriately sometimes with media reporting. And I'm not beating up the media, especially Tyler, you're here right in front center, I promise it's not you. I'm not beating up the media. I don't think they're doing it intentionally. I just don't think they know how to report on a health crisis. And I mean that sincerely. This is new for everybody. And I give them a pass in that regard, but definitely there's a little bit of a narrative because for three weeks you heard nothing except Arizona, Texas, Florida. What have you heard over the last 10 days? Nothing. 
but all the cases are dropping like a rock, why aren't we reporting that as well? And, and I just want it to be balanced because I think it should be reported that that's under control now, so we're not scaring the heck out of everybody. And now we move to the next step, and we're not out of the woods. Um, we, here, here's the big takeaways. How did those states get it under control? They closed bars and nightclubs, and they asked everyone to wear masks. You know, th those were the three comments in, in those areas. Bars and nightclubs, not, not really a conducive place when you're looking in this environment right now. And, and the bit major states, uh, California, Texas, and Florida, when they shut those down, the numbers started to come down. And, and it was just an area that really doesn't, doesn't invite for social distancing. It's not, it's not made for that. Why do I bring that up? There are gonna be learnings here. You know what everybody's struggling with? How do you do a networking reception? You don't. I mean, that's the interesting part. You, you can try to figure that out, but if you're trying to keep congestion down, we didn't have a networking reception yesterday. You don't really need one. Uh, that is our old mentality, but if you're trying to move forward right now, that's probably not the most conducive. And is there an opportunity, because many of you are gonna tie virtual into this, this piece as well, is there an opportunity that you do virtual networking, even while you're in person? There's a way to do that, and there's opportunities to do it, but we have to think about that a little differently. And, and you'll find with me, again, I, I'm very transparent, and one thing we learned in our first event, you know, we didn't have a networking reception, but we actually had on the agenda a, an optional afterglow in the lounge. That doesn't make sense. If you're not doing a networking reception, we shouldn't be encouraging people to go to the lounge, because what we found was music playing, you know what happens? You're already without your mask because you're having a drink and you start getting closer and you're talking louder. And by the way, what we have found how this spreads is by talking very loudly or singing in close proximity in, in very tight areas, i.e. bars. And, and that's not beating up the bars because you can be at a bar safely, but you have to understand you can't put volume in those bars right now. Those are the things we're having to think about. These are the things we're gonna talk about today. Uh, and we encourage to have these questions. And, and guys, we don't have all the answers. Um, I've said this often, I, I think one of the keys to my success in, in the industry has not been that I have all the answers, I know what question I should be asking. And then I'm a research junkie. And once I have the question, I go try to find the right answers with a lot of different voices and a lot of different perspectives. This is a time, because we can't find it in general society, but in our industry we have to, we have to be able to have a civil, have civil discourse and have a conversation with differing points of view. Uh, it doesn't exist in our country right now. It definitely doesn't exist in politics, but it has to exist in our industry if we're gonna be able to move forward and move forward effectively. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. I, I am not offended that somebody has a different point of view. It makes me want to learn more. And if we can all have that curiosity, we'll be moving forward much better uh, as an industry. Uh, I echo uh, Ashley's sentiment is thank you. You know, thank you for being here in person. We know for many of you this was a little bit scary. Um, we heard that at Ewell. Some of the people, the first trip, they said, I, I was a little nervous. I was a little nervous because this is my first time on an airplane. This is my first time in a hotel. And, um, you know, Carolyn then asked me, how'd you sleep? I go, really good. I mean, the, the beds here are really nice, by the way. Uh, really wonderful hotel. Um, and I don't say that just because they're our partners. I, I think uh, Omni does it well. It's one of the reasons we wanted to be here. But also understand you're dealing with psychology. One of the biggest things you're gonna have to overcome at the beginning is psychology. People are afraid and, and just intuitively they're afraid because they don't know. And when you don't know and you haven't seen it, it's scary. Why do I say that? One of the reasons I called Q, and that really is how it went down by the way. Uh, I walked in to, to Ashley and Katie, I was like, okay, we're gonna do this. And, and then I would call Q and he's like, okay, let me do a couple checks, but we're in. And at the end of it, we're starting to go and then all our people had to figure all this out. So, you know, the idea is the easy part. Uh, getting to the work, we had a lot of team members bring this together. But you know what, one of the thought processes here is this is really big space and we knew that. If you were in this same room and it felt tighter and the ceilings weren't quite as high and it didn't feel as roomy, it wouldn't feel the way it feels right now. And that was an important one from a psychology standpoint. For this to be your first meeting, you want it to be as comfortable as possible. You need to think through that when you have your first meetings. Psychology is gonna play a big part of it when it's all said and done. And then you have to be completely uh, transparent on what the rules are. You know, a a according to the CDC, you should be wearing a mask where you can't keep six feet of separation. You guys have six feet of separation at your tables. So you should be comfortable to not wear a mask. You're not gonna be speaking in droves or anything along those lines, you're fine. If you get up, 
you need to go to the restroom, you need to exit the room, you should be wearing your mask anytime you're moving. And, and that is going to be the, the protocol and the procedures we're continuing to follow going back to CDC ruling. And you're gonna see at the end of this, we'll do an executive summary for everybody to show you what we've learned. You know, we, we thought we've got it all right. And, and I will tell you, we did a double check and a triple check and we looked at CDC guidelines for live events and what that looks like to make sure we had it all covered. Uh, because we wanna make sure that we're doing it correctly and showing the path forward. So with that, I'm gonna say uh, again, thank you for being with us. Uh, make sure this is engaging. You know, Ashley said you're here to listen. You're also here to converse. Uh, we want to hear from you. We, we have it through Slido, but if you're here in person, you want to raise your hand and talk, feel free. Uh, but the questions are going to keep rolling. We're going to get to them. Uh, each one of these sessions was trying to take a subset of the industry. Um, the first session, I, I have the privilege, and again, uh, I, I thank, we've thanked the hotels. We've thanked you. I, I've got to thank everybody who's agreed to come and talk to you, present, and have a discussion and a dialogue because all we did was ask and they said yes. And, and it was wonderful to be able to say, yeah, we, we wanna make sure we take a broad cross-section of our industry so that you learn all of it and see what's going on. Uh, so first, uh, I, I get to bring up uh, two, two people that uh, are good friends, I've known them for a long time in the industry. Um, Amanda Height with Star is gonna be sharing some data with you and then we're gonna have a conversation. And then Steve Rudner, um, is one of our hospitality lawyers, and not that you guys have any legal questions whatsoever, uh, but we thought it was important for him to have a voice and important for you to understand certain issues on both sides. When you're asking about a certain question, what, what is the rub on both sides and what does that look like? Uh, so that's, that's gonna be this conversation here. Again, it's gonna be very free flowing. Thank you for being with us. I'm gonna invite uh, Amanda and Steve, come on up. Uh, Amanda's gonna take over from the presentation, but please welcome um, Amanda Height and Steve Rudner. You get the middle chair, by the way, after you present. You're welcome. Welcome, guys. And, and, and I put Amanda on the spot. Uh, Amanda, for those of you that follow the industry at all, Star is our go-to as far as what's happening in the hotel world, what's happening with demand, and uh, I, I put a man on the spot to say, you know, it's so easy to forecast. Why don't you tell us what's gonna happen? And she did. So she's taking a shot at it, and she's gonna start this to give us a little bit of a framework, and then we'll have a dialogue. Yes, so. thank you. So, I mean, the good news is, everyone knows forecasts are usually wrong, right? <laughs> but the point of a forecast is to give you general direction. So that's what I want to do today. Um, and thank you for inviting me, Mike. It is so wonderful. I just have to say thank you to all of you. This is the first time for me to be back on stage since um, February. Wow. It was my last business trip. So it's great to be on stage and see people in the audience. So this is our US forecast for the hotel industry. We just released this forecast last week. So we have, um, we usually do a quarterly forecast update with the pandemic, we've actually been doing it monthly, but um, I will say the revision was not that different, but it was a downward revision. And the, the area that we took down really was the demand growth that we expect to come back in 2020. Um, you know, the world changes every day. Like that's what we've absolutely learned during this pandemic is Every single day, something changes. Case numbers, you know, we're watching them. We're tracking the demand recovery along with the TSA passenger through count. Um, and what we had expected is that in Q4 of this year, we thought that we would see some smaller meetings, kind of essential meetings start to happen and business travel start to happen and we do not expect that now. So the forecast that you're looking at today is what we really expect that type of business to not begin until Q1 of 2021, which I think aligns with exactly what you said, Mike, is that whatever happens in 2020 is sort of gravy. Um, there's, there's not an expectation that it's going to be much different for the remainder of the year. Um, the demand that's out there that's coming in is leisure, so it's drive to, a little bit of flying, but really drive to markets, and we can get into some of those. But I want to show you, these are the actual numbers that are abs the absolute what we expect to achieve, which is actually easier to look at probably than those terrible large double digit negative numbers that we have there. And the you know, the thing here is we will not be back to our 2019 levels 
for any of our um, key performance indicators by the end of 2021. Right. Um, and I will say, I just, because I'm the data person, the asterisk there, I do have to tell you the methodology. This is new for us. I mean, the, the great thing about a data company, um, we get to change with what the times, you know, with the pandemic. and. What our methodology, we, when we calculate occupancies, we've never had to think about closed hotels as a temporary closure. So like we, we know how to do it for natural disasters. We have this methodology. But so we've now, um, last month, started reporting on total room inventory. So if you're a hotel and you're benchmarking yourself, you're using the standard STR methodology. But our total room inventory occupancies are being used for forecasting for public companies to gauge how they're doing against what the market would be. So the total room inventory methodology that we calculate the occupancy with including the temporary hotels, so you truly know what the occupancy is in the market. Um, when we report out on most markets, our standard methodology is this is the occupancy for the hotels that are open. And that's what you want to want to know if you're benchmarking yourself. But if in, in this time, we really want to know how bad is it? Um, so that, that's the occupancy t does not take the hotels that are temporary closed out of the calculation. So I just want to give you that methodology piece. And we can talk about closed hotels. You know, the good news is a lot of hotels are open. I mean, in the total U.S., we're below 10% of hotels that are still closed. But when you get into the markets, it's a different story. If, you know, if you look at San Francisco or New York or Miami, Hawaii, you know, Hawaii's basically closed. Um, and then I included the chain scales. The real story here is the luxury and upper upscale segments, which are your large meeting hotels are all in that upper upscale. You know, we expect really low occupancies. But the ADR declines, I think that's been the surprising story, have not been as deep is what a lot of people um, expected with the demand declines. So it really is the, the negative rev par on the luxury segment is really driven mostly by the occupancy declines, not by rate. And then this is um, how we expect the recovery to hap happen for each of our key performance indicators. We do anticipate that demand will recover to our 2019 levels by the middle of 2023. So that's not, that sounds sort of depressing, but the, the, ex, the good part Kinda? is, <laughs> the good part is there is, a, there is the positive news. By the end of 2021, we will have recovered 81% of the demand from awesome. 2019. So 2021 is going to be a big year for demand recovery. Yeah. Now on the revenue side, Revenue will be, it'll be 2024 before we see ADR and RevPAR get back to the 2019 levels, and room revenues next year will only be at 68% of 2019 levels. Yeah. So I'll end there and let's ask, talk I, about questions. I, I assume the answer to this is yes, but are we able to share the deck? Because I saw people Absolutely. So everybody was taking pictures. Feel free to take pictures, but we'll, we'll send Absolutely. this out to everybody as well and for those online as yes. well, but thank you for that. Um, when I look at that, so many variables, and I know there are, so let me ask you about a couple of the variables. If, um, if we know there's a vaccine by the end of the year, even though if it's gonna be implemented in 21, do you think that changes this? Uh, the timeline from 23 maybe may a shot at getting there at end of 22? Maybe. Yeah. Um, we don't, we did not take vaccine therapeutic yeah. into our forecast um, because you just don't know and yeah. it does change daily. Um, you know, our demand forecast is based on what we see happening today yeah. and what we know is sort of on the books for the rest of the year from our clients that, you know, it's just, there's not a lot of business, group business out there. Now, just, there are a lot of markets that are doing really well right now. But they're markets that we've never talked about before <laughs> because it's all leisure driven and it's montana and south dakota yeah. and you know the beach towns that is uh you know that that's the interesting thing i think everybody needs to look at it's in pockets and i think like everything with this pandemic it's very much where you live it, it's the same with the hotel world it looks very different depending on where you are but as you just said our biggest meeting markets are 
the ones that are probably hit the hardest at the moment. Yeah, San Francisco, yeah. New York, Miami. Yeah, and, and Amanda and I talked about this briefly. You know, what, one of the things, that, the reason I'm asking her that is realize this is everything we know today. It, it changes dramatically as we start getting, and I, I keep going back to the psychology. Uh, there will be a psychology shift, you know, a psychological shift in our country when we know we have a vaccine, when we know yeah. we have a path. Um, it doesn't, there's all kinds of how do you implement, when are you going to get the vaccine, but knowing there's a path forward, I think will change a lot of the mood. Um, and, and I think that's going to be positive for us moving forward. But I, I, I thank Amanda because it's like, yeah, it's like, tell us what the world's going to look like. And, and she's doing her best at the, with everything you know right now. Yeah, well, I would say we, um, so we track hotel data all over the world. So we have been watching China. I mean, it, we experienced as a company, we experienced this with China first. We saw hotels closing in January. I have 12 employees in Beijing. They went on holiday for Chinese New Year and never went back to the office and started working from home. So we have been tracking, and if you follow STR at all, and we're doing weekly webinars and putting out data, so we're tracking US, Europe, China. And we're very hopeful with the recovery that we've seen in China. Um, they have business travel, domestic business travel has come back, and they are having business small group meetings in, in just domestic players. You know, I will say, I don't think, while we're optimistic that that will happen in the U.S., there is a difference in how we're handling, you know, mask, contact tracing. Um, it's very different in China than the U.S. So it, we're, we're very cautious not to say, hey, this is exactly how it's going to happen for us. Um, and that we're not predicting it will happen exactly the same way, but they certainly are one to watch to see where business is coming back and meetings are happening and how they're doing it. Steve. Um, I just wanted to add something about uh, 2021. And uh, our, our law firm doesn't do anything other than represent hotels in regard to group sales issues. And so this is, we, I don't have access, wouldn't pretend to have access to the type of data that you do, but I, I want to throw out one interesting variable. Um, we've seen a tremendous, I'm sure all of you have seen a tremendous number of, of cancellations for 2020 being resolved with you can keep the deposit or keep some part of the deposit and I'll give you a 2021 meeting and we'll apply, everybody knows the kind of deals that we're talking about. What is of some concern to me uh, that, that relates to what 2021 will look like is we have a lot of hotels that are making deals with large groups keep the deposit, apply this percentage of the deposit, but instead of, and now I will sign the contract for my 2021 dates, the deal is you can keep the deposit and I can have 25% of that back towards my 2021 meeting, which will be of equal or greater size, but we'll figure out when that 2021 meeting will be later. And so we're now inserting provisions in all of those deals, and I would recommend that you do as well, to specify that until a contract is signed for that replacement meeting, the group bears the risk that its space may not be available. Because I think, based on the deals that we're seeing, and I, it's anecdotal, I think we're seeing a tremendous number of hotels making deals with a lot of groups to have credit for their 2021 meeting, and when they all decide to do it, it will not be possible for all of them to fit in 2021. So I, I, I think that'll be... That's a good, great yeah, point. It's not, it's not a booking, it's not data, but it's, yeah. it's people who you would expect will want to use the credit that they have. Well, and specifically, if there's any of these protocols still in place, because space will become even more at a premium in that regard. That, that's a very good point. And uh, Steve, how's it feel to be the only lawyer in the room? <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody shot me, so it's all right. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm going to throw one to Steve. I, I, we've had these conversations. And um, again, I, I've known Steve for a long time. And what I've loved is he's always just matter of fact and looking at both sides of, of a discussion, uh, there's a lot of conversation around force majeure and force majeure clauses, and we've seen that. Well, I've got to add this, I've got to add that. You've said something 90 days ago that stuck with me. A well-written force majeure clause will cover you in, in these situations. What does that look like? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> and I'll, I've said this so many times, I'll try and say it in as concise of a way as I can. Whenever anything bad happens, and this pandemic is the best example of it, I think the natural instinct of a planner is to run to change their force majeure clause to figure out how not to be in this situation in the future. 
And so we now have all sorts of groups that are asking for all sorts of additional language, not just pandemic and epidemic, but uh, all the things, X number of people can't travel, and, uh, and what if there are new social distancing requirements? Uh, Want to change everything that you can about a force majeure clause. And the correct response, I believe, is exactly the opposite. I think a well-written force majeure clause does not need to change based on circumstance, and the best evidence of that that we have is that every group that has not been able to have a meeting, every group for whom holding a meeting has become impossible because of regulations or, the, or whatever, the city won't accommodate it, or the, they've all been allowed to cancel if their invocation of the existing force majeure clause has been proper. The existing, you, you can't use whatever force majeure clause you had, you can't use now to cancel your meeting in 2025. That's as it should be. If your meeting was supposed to happen next month and you're in a city where meetings are not allowed, your force majeure clause has already covered you. So I think before we start running to change a force majeure clause, we ought to ask the group who is requesting the change, what happened, what meeting were you forced to cancel because the city couldn't accommodate you or the, the regulations wouldn't allow the meeting to occur or someone sent you a bill for that? And the answer is that didn't happen and that proves you don't need to change your force majeure clause. When we change it, we're gonna run into unintended consequences, and one of those is a force majeure clause is a two-way street. So if you're a group and you make the force majeure clause too loose, you will find when demand uh, regains its strength, hotels that will say, listen, I've got other groups that'll pay higher rates that are more lucrative, and this force majeure clause is so loose, maybe it's time for us to cancel the group. And nobody sees that coming. So the, to answer your question as succinctly as I can, and it's too late for that, a properly written force majeure clause <laughs> needs to say, in the event of act of God, war, terrorist act, riot, disaster, strike, government regulation, you can add pandemic or epidemic, you can add anything objective that you want, any one of which makes performance impossible or illegal, and that's the standard, then the party's performance is excused. And there, you can, you can say, as some hotels do, to the extent that performance becomes impossible. Right. So we have groups now that say, I was supposed to have 1,000 people, but because of social distancing, I can only have 500 and I need to cancel. And if you have the, to the extent language in your clause, then your response is, well, you can have 500 of the people not come, but it's still possible for the other 500 to be here and we'll expect that. Um, you can have a notice requirement so that you have to tell me within X number of days of learning of your force majeure condition uh, that you're going to cancel, which enables me to make some sort of prediction of the business that I'll actualize. But the farther that we stray, just like we did after September 11th, when groups wanted to add, if my people are afraid to get on a plane, or if I survey, my, it, we're just gonna wind up in a, a really bad place and there's no need for it. Yeah, I, I, I know one thing I've heard, and I think it's important, is when people talk about adding pandemic to a force majeure, the pandemic is not the force majeure. It is the outcomes of the pandemic that are, correct? Correct, yes, yeah. but yes, certainly that's correct. And, and I didn't mean to, to say so easily, sure, throw epidemic into your yeah. force majeure clause because we have epidemics every year. We have a cold and flu epidemic every season and we will again. And I don't think anybody wants to let a group get out of their contract because the flu's going around. And not to minimize the circumstance that we're in now. And, and that's why you should give some serious thought to what you want to include in your objective list. But the most important thing is, whatever the item is on the objective list, it has to be something that makes performance impossible or illegal. So a flu epidemic would not make performance impossible or illegal, and that's your second level of protection if you've written your force majeure clause correctly. It's, um, it, it, I think it's interesting because we, we tend to overcorrect Absolutely. And for a variety of reasons, not just with contract language. <laughs> we tend to overcorrect when we're in situation. We've never been in a situation like this. And I'm just cautioning people that I think we should learn through this before we just correct through this. And, and I, I think, Mike, the, the way that to, I, I'm serious when I say this, I wasn't suggesting it hypothetically. I think the right discussion with the group is who wants to make major changes to a force majeure clause, what bad thing happened to you as the result of the force majeure clause that you had, which right. necessitates the change? And the answer is nothing bad happened. Right, and, and that's the important one. I, having a tough conversation or it being difficult to have those conversations wasn't a bad thing happening. Uh, and and that was, that's what stuck out to me. How, how many, did you tell me at the end of it, of the thousands of 
cases that you've been dealing with or conversations, how many have ended up in court or in so, that conversation? So here's an interesting uh, calculation. So as of the end of the day yesterday, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have um, been involved in more than 3,000 disputes between groups and hotels. And these are not things, obviously, that got resolved on the hotel level. These are disputes that have bubbled up to us. Um, um, we have resolved a huge number of those. Um, we have not filed a single lawsuit on behalf of a single hotel company in any one of those matters in order to get things resolved. Um, and we have had seven groups who have filed suits against hotel companies, um, anticipating that the hotel was gonna come after them for damages and seeking a declaration by the court that they don't have to perform. And of those seven lawsuits, four are already resolved um, all favorably for the hotel. Out of 3,000. So I, I, that was stunning to me when he, he had said that, and that's where it stuck with me about that. Well, let me say this before, okay. before I, I make that sound too optimistic. Let me <laughs> add a, a pessimistic footnote. One of the things that we've been saying to hotels who, who have had groups that have canceled for irrational reasons, for, for dates far into the future, for times when they were open and able to serve and whatever. Um, the fact that we have, that the, that the number of suit, that no suits have been filed on behalf of hotels, at least by our firm, doesn't mean that none will. And what I mean by that is, if you're a hotel and you've got a group that's breached and owes you $500,000, you don't have to file that lawsuit today, although you'd like to, to get your cash flow. But the courts have been closed mm -hmm. and public sentiment is what it is. You've got, in some states, a four, five, six, or seven year statute of limitations. And so I've said to our clients, I know you want your money now, you're not gonna get it from this group for multiple reasons, including the court is closed. You don't need to file this suit today. Um, the way that we felt the week after September 11th was a lot different than the way that we felt a year of, uh, after September 11th about September 11th. Still a tragedy, but we processed it and we dealt with it. And the same is true about this pandemic. And so I think that a year from now, hopefully when everything is back to normal and we're all, this is becoming a distant memory, I think you'll find some hotels that will revisit the groups that canceled when they didn't have a rational reason for doing that. And I anticipate there will be litigation then. Hey, uh, Steve, we're gonna go to some of these questions that are coming up. First one came up was, when would it be appropriate to invoke a force majeure clause for Q1 2020? Groups want to plan accordingly, but how long do we need to wait? Love that question. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm hesitant to answer in the way that I will because it will lead to, a week from now, new force majeure requests. <laughs> but a force majeure clause, I recognize that planning a meeting, and particularly a big meeting, is an overwhelming ordeal. I recognize that. But a force majeure clause does not excuse your performance because it's become more difficult to plan your meeting. And it doesn't excuse your performance because it now will take more time or resources to plan your meeting. So we have groups that are canceling now saying, well, wh when can I invoke a force majeure clause? Because this would be the time for me to start sending out my invitations and lining up my vendors and my speakers and all that. I'm with you, I understand that. That is not what a force majeure clause is intended to do. A force majeure clause comes into play when it becomes impossible or illegal to have your meeting. And there is no one in this room, there's no one anywhere who can tell me today what 2021, what, there is, there's no state that has made, or no city that has made regulations that bar meetings from happening in any date of 2021. Um, and even if they had those orders, if some governor today said, we won't have any meetings for all of 2021, that governor can change his or her mind in the next day. Um, and so the answer is you can cancel your meeting when it has become impossible or illegal. You cannot cancel your meeting under a force majeure clause before then. Right. You can, you can cancel at any time, of course, but it won't be excused by the force majeure clause. Right, and, and I think that's an important one. We, we've talked about force majeure and, and talking about 21. I, I think, and, and this has always been my recommendation, have a very candid conversation with your hotel. Uh, there are other issues that are outside force majeure, but the moment you try to invoke force majeure and it's not applicable, you, you've now started a, a battle versus saying we're having financial difficulties, we may not have, an, you know, I heard conversations of, you know, maybe I had an incentive trip and there's no one to incent because we have no sales. Um, that changes the diagram, but that's a different conversation with the hotel than trying to say I'm canceling because of force majeure. 
and, and those, everyone in this room knows, those are the conversations that will, you won't be anywhere close to litigation and you won't be anywhere close mm -hmm. to talking to lawyers because now we're speaking truthfully to each other. Right. I'm, not, I'm not jerking you around, I'm not trying to invoke a clause that doesn't apply, I wanna be honest with you about my circumstance I'm, we can't have the meeting not because of the law. We can't have the meeting because we won't have any people. And can you work with me? And everyone in this room would say, of course we can work with you, and thank you for being honest. Right. Rather than, why are you pulling this legal, ridiculous stunt? And those are the ones that get resolved quickly. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's just important and to be emphatic about that. Just have a real conversation. Um, it, it's not a force majeure in that regard, um, but if you're having other issues that you need to talk about, talk to your hotel partner. And, and Mike, can I just add, Please. I'm sorry for babbling so much. <laughs> you know, we've conditioned groups over the years that the earlier you cancel, the less you owe under everybody's cancellation clause. And so every group is in a hurry to cancel their meeting as soon as they think they might have to. Right. If it's really a force majeure, you don't have to cancel so early, depending on the language of your clause, but you can wait until you're certain. Uh, if it's a true force majeure, you don't have to rush. So I think as a, as a hotel salesperson, when someone starts mentioning force majeure, I think you want to immediately try and see if you can put that genie back in the bottle and say, you, if there's really a force majeure, you don't have to tell me that today. But if you tell me that today, and you're canceling today, and it's not really a force majeure, then you're breaching your contract. So you, you really don't want to be saying that. Let's, let's wait. There is no reason for you to cancel too early under a, a force majeure clause, again, depending upon the terms of the clause. And never apologize about talking. We know you get paid by the minute, so we're good. <laughs> That's how lawyers go. We're okay. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna throw the next one to Amanda, uh, room rental. Uh, any data that you've seen on that? I, I know you track it, but I, since it's disappeared, yeah. uh, I, I don't know if there's any insight in that. I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. um, I know what we've heard, and you just had your data conference. We did. Um, which I, we did not have in person. And I, I've just lived what Steve explained for the last few minutes. So we, I mean, we canceled our in-person hotel data conference last, we had it last week, but we canceled the in-person part of it 10 days before um, that we were, because we could not, people could not travel to Nashville because Tennessee, and, and we couldn't have a meeting that big. So, yeah. yeah I, I just thought it was interesting. Did you hear anything from hoteliers? What, we have heard so far between now and the end of the year for any of the meetings happening, there's no pass on a cost right now. There, people are just trying to meet. Yeah. And, and we want you to meet. And that's what we're hearing. Now, if this goes long term, that's a different conversation. Yeah. I, I mean, what we're hearing from hoteliers is they're working with every group that's still on the books um, for the rest of the year to try to make a meeting work. Because it is, I mean, like this experience, it is a lab. Like, yeah. it is the first of their, for a lot of hotels, it's the first meeting that they have. They're like, and that was the hope with our hotel data conference in Nashville, the hotel was like, yes, you'll be our first group meeting and this is the experiment. And so they were phenomenal to work with until it was just by law, we could not have that many people in a room. Right. So um, we don't have any data coming in. I mean, there's just not group data coming in right now. Yeah. So we do track the group demand, the group revenue, the, the breakout of F&B and other revenue, but it's just, there's not anything out there right now. I, I hope, and you just experienced it, I really do hope that we get to a point that uh, state by state and even in areas that there's logic to the rules, um, to have caps on numbers, to say, I can't have more than 50 people meet. I, I've had these conversations, I'm like, because 48 is not risky. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because the logic is 48 people in a phone booth is different than 48 people in 4,000 square feet. Yeah. And without putting context around a number, the numbers are literally silly. And, and I'm okay telling any public official that it's silly because you're not putting context around the room. Look at this room. Yeah. That This is 120 people in, in a room that literally, I think in normal times could probably hold five to 600 people. Right. But I don't think anybody feels that they're cramped or doesn't have their space. And that, that's where I'm, uh, I'm frustrated and there's not much we can do except continuing to have the, that dialogue. And I do think certain states can lead that because they're doing it by capacity, i.e. Texas is one of them, and that's why you're here. I'll say for, from our experience in Nashville last week trying to have Hotel Data Conference, the city was amazing to work with. So we did, we reached out to the Convention and Visitors Bureau and started talking to them about, you know, what are your partners doing to have meetings and just trying to learn about how to have a meeting. 
and they actually connected us with the Metro Health Department in Nashville. And so we worked with the Health Department to make sure that we had the right um, spacing and in, ingress to the meeting room and everything. And so the Health Department actually signed off and said, we're okay if you go above our regulation for number of people. So the Health Department wants to test out the meetings right. also. So they, they want to get back to business. So it was, the city would have let us have the meeting, but so many of our attendees could not come to Nashville because of the travel restrictions. When they return home, they would have to quarantine for 14 days, right. and that was just, the attendees were like, we can't do it. Or they work for companies who say you cannot travel. So. It is one of the reasons we said today was so important. Uh, because we need to show people that you can do this. And the more you can show it, the more we have examples when people are sitting in somebody's office with a governor or a mayor or a health official to say, look, we've seen this, and by the way, it followed protocols that are out there to, to CDC guidelines at this point. Steve, Steve uh, it throws right into that segue on the next question. Uh, attaching hotel protocols as part of a contract. Um, recommendations? <laughs> uh, I think it's a horrible idea. Um, and let me see if I can just broaden that for a second. Please. <laughs> uh, we, we have seen a tremendous number of groups who say to hotels, when a hotel says, no, we, 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 we really need you to go forward with your meeting in 2021. It's not covered by, you're not excused. We expect you to be here. And we've seen groups who have said, well, then you're going to have to guarantee me that no one's going to get sick. And you're going to have to indemnify me in case somebody becomes sick. And that's going to become your responsibility. And we see a, a significant number of hotels trying to respond to that by saying, well, this is how we're gonna keep your people healthy and here are our cleaning protocols and we're gonna attach our cleaning protocols as part of the contract. First of all, if you attach, your, it's nice to have cleaning protocols. It's nice to have safety guidelines. I, I think every one of our hotels wants to do that. I'm not sure that you want to expose yourself to being sued for breach of contract when one person forgets to do one thing in one unoccupied room that has no impact on anybody. So there's a difference between changing your guidelines and this is what we intend to do to this is how we can be sued if we don't do exactly what we just said every minute. So I'm not a fan of that. Uh, but the larger subject is this. It's not, uh, and I think we've all forgotten this and we have to find a nice way to say it. It's not any hotel's obligation to guarantee any group that no one will get sick. I don't know how we could possibly do that. The, the, the best that we can do and what we are required to do is to say that we will abide by all applicable laws and regulations. Um, that's our obligation, right? But, but you can't, I don't know how you could possibly assure somebody that nobody will get sick in a hotel. People can get the flu in the hotel. People can get a cold in a hotel. People can get COVID in a hotel. Um, and when groups ask hotels to indemnify, I want you to agree we see this all the time in really nasty language from a lot of groups. If you're going to force me to have this meeting, then when I get sued because someone gets sick, you're going to be responsible for that. And there are two answers to that question. And one is, first of all, it's an irrational thought because if someone gets sick and sues your group, um, then they would have to, and then you want to sue us at the hotel, someone's going to have to prove that the person who got sick got sick at the hotel, not on the flight, not on the Uber drive, not in the cab ride not talking to someone on the street before they entered the hotel, you're never gonna be able to prove that, and so that's not an issue, but, and your attendee's not gonna be able to prove that it happened at your meeting, and so none of us are gonna wind up sued for that and lose, that's part A. Um, but we also have to say to groups who become irrational, if you make me go forward with this meeting and someone gets sick, the answer is, wait a minute, I'm not making you go forward with any meeting or not. If you're upset, if you're really worried, if you're, freaked out and you don't think you can have the meeting, then you can cancel the meeting. You have to pay for canceling it if it's not covered by the force majeure clause, but that's a choice that you can make. There's no hotel that's forcing anybody to meet anywhere. It's, um, it's an interesting one because we've talked about this and for everybody in the room, the legislation that is stalled in Washington right now has uh, literally a safe harbor provision that was a big piece of the bill that would protect from frivolous lawsuits that Steve was just talking about. To say, look, if you're an entity and you've done everything you're supposed to be doing to the CDC guidelines and health guidelines, you can't be sued. Um, and, and that was an important part of this legislation that's getting caught up in politics right now. 
uh, and it is going to be stuck in a bill. I, I don't see a path forward because you know the the house went on recess. Um, yeah, they're coming back. They're only going to deal with the post office, and they're not going to deal with anything else. Um, but th yeah. that that is a bigger issue. And that's an issue to get people traveling again. Agreed. Right? Like Agreed. as an employer, you're not willing to put people on the road yeah. if there's a chance of a lawsuit when you have put all these protocols in place. Yeah. B b business travel specifically, if we're going to see any give in business travel, there's a big piece of the liability. And companies are concerned, am I liable, for the same reason Steve just said. And, and they said it's almost impossible to prove, but that's not what you want to be dealing with with your employee to begin with. So uh, I, I say that because please reach out to your, <laughs> to your officials and let them know it's important that they get this piece of the bill done. And, and um, unfortunately, it's the way Washington works. It all gets dumped into a bill and now it's a negotiation. And, and it's a bargaining chip. Uh, and, and it's sitting in this bill, but. I don't think it's going to get separated by itself, but it should be because it's an important one. And, and for everybody else, there's another piece uh, that has been supported. I, I hope it gets done by the end of the year, but PREA, uh, which is a Pandemic Relief Insurance Act, would be really beneficial for most people in this room. Uh, it would actually give you real insurance that would get paid out <laughs> in the effect of something like this. And then more importantly, uh, it would also give you business disruption insurance for us that are small businesses and such. So if you think about PPP, had we had small uh, inter business interruption insurance, that was PPP. And, and the way this legislation is being written is the government is going to backstop most of the payment. So that would encourage the insurance companies to actually pay you because it's not their money, it's the government's funding that would be coming out. But if you think about it in theory, if something like this happens again, you're not having to pass all kinds of stimulus bills. It's already built into an insurance program that we've been paying into over a long period of time. Important pieces of legislation that, again, nobody's talking about in the media, and it's important for you to be educated on it, and we'll send information out just so that you're aware and we see some progress. And uh, candidly, I just don't have a lot of hope that much will move until after the election, and I think it's, it's standard politics, and that's not talking politics, it's just it's the reality of politics. You're in an election year. Couldn't it be a worse year for a pandemic for a variety of reasons. Uh, and one of them is uh, having a presidential election going on. Yeah. Um, Steve, this one comes up all the time. Commercially impractical. Um, it's, question is, what about adding commercially impractical in addition to illegal or, and or impossible? So this is why people hate lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for those of you that haven't heard me say this before, I'm sorry. Um, there is a, the law defines commercially impracticable. That's a legally defined term. The law does not define commercially impractical. And those two things do not mean the same thing. Do not necessarily, in some states they do, in some states they don't. In every state, commercially impracticable is a defined term. And my opinion, although obviously everybody ought to be guided by their own company's law department and, and lawyers or whomever that is, in order for something to become commercially impracticable, it might as well become impossible. Those two, the way the law defines commercially impracticable, it's a very high threshold for a group to overcome. So I don't really have a problem with adding commercially impracticable to a force majeure clause if that's what we need to do to get the deal done. Um, commercially impractical, I would never add to a force majeure clause, and certainly impractical alone because impractical means I don't think it's a practical time to have a meeting right now. Um, and so uh, the, the language matters. There, there's another one, Steve. Um, uh, if the city is not allowing, this is an interesting one because we've talked about this, if the city is not allowing meetings to take place at the moment, what is a reasonable timeline for force majeure to be applied before arrival? So there is no answer to that question. Yeah. There is no I can't, no one can give you any timeline. And that's so unsettling and so uncomfortable for planners, and I understand that. Um, but if the city today is not allowing meetings to occur and your meeting is scheduled for five weeks from today, that's not a force majeure. If you're asking me, do you, do you have to wait until the day the meeting is supposed to begin and then say the city's not allowing the meeting so we're canceling? No, you don't have to wait until that day. Where the line is, I can't tell you, but
but I can tell you, and we all know instinctively what it is, right? Although we can't express it that way. When the, somebody's canceling six months out, we know you can't do that. When somebody's canceling four weeks out, maybe you can. Um, but there is no, the law doesn't define when that is. The law only requires that when you cancel, you can prove that holding your meeting will be impossible or illegal. It's, um, it, it, I love the way you said it, because it is unsettling, but it is the reality. And I, I go back to something I said earlier. There is what is legal, and then there is your partnership in discussing and having real conversations with your hotels. And, and I can't stress that enough. You know, the, the, the legal aspect sometimes doesn't answer the question you're trying to answer and, and won't fix the issue you're trying to fix. And that's important to have a conversation with your hotel partners to make sure that you guys can come to a solution. And, and so many groups, and I recognize that cash flow is not just a problem for our industry, but for a lot of the groups that we're dealing with as well. But if, when a group comes to the table and says, we're going to have to cancel this meeting, but we recognize the cash flow position that your hotel is in, and so of course you can keep the deposit and we'll apply that towards the future. The, the, when we start having that conversation, that's the way to start talking. When we get a letter from a group that says, we're having to cancel the meeting, you need to send us the deposit back within the next five days, and we don't know if we're ever gonna have face-to-face -face meetings again. So <laughs> we're not interested in talking about any future meeting in any capacity because we just don't see any path ever towards a face-to-face -face meeting. I, I can tell you which, which one is going to the lawyers and which one is not going to the lawyers. True letters? Say it. Have you seen those letters? Oh yeah. <laughs> I've seen, I, have a, I have a collection and, and, and we'll all look back and laugh 10 years from now at the groups who have said, we don't think there will ever be face-to-face -face meetings again. Uh, Amanda, let me throw something to you. The, um, I, I, I've been thinking about what's happening with the consumer. You've talked about leisure. And it's interesting that what we're seeing right now is savings are up dramatically in the trillions as far as bank holdings. Consumer debt is down. You just saw what happened with Target this morning and Walmart, and they're blowing out numbers. It, it tells me when we have a path forward, we have a consumer that's in a real different place than we were in 2008 when debt was high, savings was low. It, it's different. Yeah. How do you, and, and I know it's not factored in here and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I'm just saying, how do yeah. you try to come, come to grips with that? Because to me, that's something that could move faster. Absolutely. That's one of the, I mean, we do look at that because it is the overall economy and you can get sort of caught up where the economic recovery right now has plateaued a little. And yeah. we're, when, when you look at it, you're like, that's one of the things that scares you, but we track the um, personal savings rate. So as a percentage of your income, it was, it had, it, at the peak of when it jumped up, it was like 40% of disposable income people were saving. It's dropped back down to about 20% right now. But there is income of people that they have disposable income to spend, and we think that bodes well for leisure travel, hopefully for the rest of this year. Right. I mean, that is, and we were talking about it last night, you know, Dan keeps saying it's the endless summer. <laughs> Absolutely. You can work from anywhere. Your kids are probably schooling virtually. Um, Mine are not, but there is an option for virtual school for mine. So you could travel. Um, people do have money in savings at a higher rate than they have before. The, the other positive is when we look at unemployment, um, the unemployment numbers are terrible. We still have 13 million unemployed. But the people who have not lost their jobs are the higher wage earners that are able to work from home and do or work remotely. So those higher wage earners are still employed and they do have money to spend. So those are consumers that will be feeling, filling hotels from a leisure perspective. You know, one of the things that we've not talked about, um, and I think it bears both upon uh, individual travel and group travel as well, is the idea of, of taking what we're doing at our hotels to deal with safety and making that uh, almost an amenity. And here's what I mean by that. I, I, I have been back on the road and I have been traveling and I've stayed at some fantastic luxury hotels over the last few weeks. And at many of them, in advance of my arrival, and not because I'm their lawyer, but because it's a, a thing that they're doing, um, at many of them, I've received an email from the concierge three or four weeks before, or, or almost as soon as I've made my reservation. 
and they've said, in addition to all of these things, this is what's open, this is not what's not open, but these are the things that we're doing for your safety, and I would love to get on the phone with you and discuss any concerns that you have, or how we're doing this, or what's expected in the restaurants or the public spaces, and really reaching out in a personal way to make people feel secure and safe, and I think that's been really very effective. That, that's outstanding, and you know, that it's a great lesson for everybody, uh, especially for the virtual audience here. We had a call um, last week to let everybody know, here's what to expect. And, and here's gonna be the expectation. Here's what to expect from the hotel. Here's what we expect from you um, as far as being an attendee. And then here's what you can expect from us. And, and then we've had reminders as we got, even last night at dinner, we're talking about, here's what we're trying to do. I, what you're saying, I think it's so important because I, I, I do believe m most importantly, we're, we're habitual <laughs> and we're changing a lot of habits. And you know, I, Amanda last night at dinner, she goes, I just want to give you a hug. And I go, I know, it's like we know each other. And you just, you just so badly want to go to normal behavior. But in this environment, specifically with us, I see everybody in this room, we're trying to lead a path forward. It's more critical that we show that we need to follow protocol so that we build confidence with local authorities, local health departments. It's not about us feeling good about it. Um, I know we want a hug, and we do, but it's not the appropriate thing to do right now when you're trying to say this is the protocol to be able to handle a safe meeting in this environment. I, I think we also have to look specifically at our own properties. So I was on the phone last week with a group that was just freaked out about everything, and they got calmed down, and ultimately the last question was, we, the reason that we can't have our meeting is we just can't have more than two or three people in an elevator at a time, and when we are moving our people throughout the hotel, it's gonna be a huge problem because of, uh, and I said to the group, and I, I don't mean to mock anybody at all, I said, you, you recognize this hotel is three stories tall, right? And, and I know that we all like to use elevators, but, and I know that there are some people who have to use elevators, but a great majority of your people will be actually able to walk either the one or two stories necessary to get to their room, um, but I think we've just lost some rationality in our thinking. Well, and in three stories, a third of the hotels, or right a third up. of it's on the ground. Right yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, look, we're at the end of time. Uh, some closing optimistic notes on your part as far as, you know, and, and I mean that not, not big picture. I, I'm as simple as usually tomorrow's going to be a better day. Mm -hmm. And we know that. We don't know when. Um, that would be my optimism. But Amanda, anything to share with the group? Yes, so recovery is inevitable. So it will happen, yeah. um, and we're starting it with an event like this, so thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you for your time. Steve? Yeah, I think uh, anecdotally and, and not statistically, I think uh, group business is gonna come back stronger than ever because I think that this absence, this everybody being at home, I, yeah. think, I think we are sick of being at home. I think mm -hmm. we're sick of not seeing each other. I think people will, as soon as they feel secure, seize the very first opportunity that they can to get back with colleagues and back feeling that life is back to normal. And I think, I don't know when it will happen, but I think, I think there will be more hunger for more group yeah. activity than we have ever seen. Uh, I think we truly don't appreciate what we have until it's been taken away. Okay. Yep. And, and it was taken away from us. And I think we'll have a better appreciation. So for everyone in the room, uh, remember that when you're standing in line, waiting to check in somewhere, or you have a airline. I, I'm like, I'm glad to have a, an airplane that's delayed right now. I'm fine. <laughs> I, I really am. I would love to be on an airplane, even if it's a, a delay. Uh, but I think it's important because we get spoiled very quickly. And I, I hope we have that same appreciation coming out of this. And on an appreciation note, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, blessing us with your time and your knowledge today. And, uh, and being with us in person, we really do appreciate it. Real pleasure. Yeah, please, guys, give it up for thank you. our thank first you. two panelists. Thank you, guys.